All right, so let's have some fun, shall we? Maybe, hopefully. What are you looking at me for? You've, you've come with fun, yes? I bought some candy. Candy is fun. Oh, for me. <laughs> Fuck. So uh, if you haven't, uh, if you weren't here last year, haven't been to UX Mad, you probably don't know who this gentleman is. Because those are the only two things that he's famous for. Right? Yeah. Right. Anybody want some candy? Yeah. So, uh... Yeah. Fuck off, diabetic. <laughs> Go and be diabetic over there. <laughs> We're, was that a hilarious joke? No, I didn't get it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hilarious. Uh, ladies, ladies. Does anybody else want to throw candy out instead of me? Harrison, you asshole. <laughs> Sorry, my son, one of my sons is here. So, note to self. For next time, I've got no, to bring no. vegan candy, the, the fucking what? Uh, uh, the, the second floor is, is where the non-vegans, non-diabetics are. Well, that'll teach them to sit up there, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, Martin Atkins. <laughs> <laughs> so, this isn't me being nice, throwing candy. I really don't give a fuck. What, what, this is so you'll be like, oh, what a great fucking lecture. <laughs> so, <laughs> I felt strangely energized all the way through this lecture. That's because, uh, yeah, for those of you who've jumped into, plus, this laxative chocolate is really good for you <laughs> after the, you want to finish throwing that out for me? Um, so, what I'm going to talk about today, and here's another bag. Let's do a bag. Can I get this up there? Oh, fuck. Whoa! So, here's a couple of minutes about me. For my time with Public Image Limited, featuring Johnny Rotten of the Sex Pistols. To the Suicide Girls, from American Bandstand. Hello. What's your name, please? Martin Atkins. Welcome. To MTV. From Nine Inch Nails to Pig Face. Since 1979, I've been at the cutting edge, the forefront of dangerous, innovative, alternative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, this is my punk lecture. Uh, yeah, that's here. And that isn't a mistake. So I'm, I'm talking about punk. Who threw that back? Hair and chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> that's later. Um, I originally uh, did this lecture at the University of Southern California in 2007 when it was like five ideas written on the back of a brown paper bag. And it was called the socio-economic backdrop, socio-political economic backdrop to the punk rock revolution. And I'm not an expert on punk. I was just in it. I was in a band with Johnny Rotten for five years called Public Image Limited uh, from 79 to 85. Uh, but before that, I was a kid growing up in England during punk. So that's what this is kind of. And then it goes completely off the rails, no pun intended. Um, um, it just goes off the rails and connects a bunch of different things that are important to me and I think have something to do with punk. So, I was born in 1959, which makes me f uh, 54. I started playing drums when I was nine, started drinking Newcastle Brown Ale when I was 11. Um, yeah, I used to live in Durham, which is really close to Newcastle. So that's what all the kids did. Um, and I started uh, playing in the bands, uh, uh, like cover bands in the north of England. There was a club in every mining town. Um, 
what's his name? Sting used to play in a band called Last Exit at Newcastle Labour Club. They used to play at Newcastle Labour Club all the time. I was in a band called The Mind, M-Y-N-D, not M-I, and we had something called a Mellotron, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. It was kind of the first sampler. And we had these long-winded psychedelic songs. The guitarists had flare-sleeved shirts. Um, I remember uh, we were doing some Yes covers. And um, I, of course, I was, I was playing drums. So I'd see the guitarist in this, in this satin lace-up shirt with the flared sleeves and like with his double neck guitar, 12 string and a 6 string, so he could just masturbate constantly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'd be drumming, <laughs> my, uh, yeah. Uh, but nobody could see my view. I wish I'd taken a picture, it's in my head, of this great big iron mark that his mom had like burnt the back of his satin shirt. So he would, he would, never, t it would never turn his back to the audience. That's just, yeah. Anyway, this is me on stage with the mind. You want to talk logos and graphic art, we got those, <laughs> yeah, stick-on letters on the Mellotron. That's, that's me playing drums. Uh, and this is a Mellotron. It's kind of the first sampler. Every key on the keyboard was basically the play button of a tape machine. It was like, it was insane. It was the heaviest fucking thing. And it was supposed to replace like a horn section or a string section or a choir. But the wow and flutter of the tape machine gave the Mellotron its own kind of hauntingly, um, uh, that haunting sound, right, of, of, of the wow and flutter of the tapes. It's just kind of awesome. But anyway, uh, here's my school report. I don't know why I put this in here. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it, hey, where did I get A minus? For what? B minus for drugs. A for alcohol. <laughs> um, I think I put this in there to make my eldest son, Ian, feel a little better because we're pretty much neck and neck. Uh, <laughs> satis Martin has ability but lacks application. Fuck you. <laughs> and, but, you know... This is from some kind of bygone era, old quill pen bullshit school report, right? And, and I know I was doing really badly because my mom signed this. She, she didn't even let my dad see it. Yeah. Wow. Continues to work well. I'm going to hold on to that. So in July 75, Britain was in recession. Unemployment figures were the worst since World War II. School leavers least likely to find work. Sounds familiar. Public spending had risen to 45% of national income. And the optimism of the 60s had started to fade away. Um, I've forgotten about the troubles in Northern Ireland and how close they were to home in England. So this wasn't like, oh yeah, there's a conflict over there. Read about it in the papers, watch it on the television. Um, if you've been to, if, if you've flown into England, what is it, Heathrow, Gatwick? Have you ever tried to throw something away in a trash container? Right? As soon as you bite into an English sandwich, oh fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was 11 pounds, but I'm not eating this shit. No fucking. There's no garbage because that's where the IRA put all the fucking bombs. Right? Oh, yeah, hilarious. Hey! Yeah, it's true. Uh, right. Um, there are just bombs everywhere. And it wasn't just London, like government offices. It was like all through the suburbs and the north of England and everywhere. If you saw like a package on a bus... It wasn't like, oh, Mrs. Smith left her shopping. It was like, oh, fuck, it's a fucking bomb. There's a bomb. It was just kind of crazy. Uh, we had the Guildford pub bombings in 74. Provisional IRA detonated two six-pound gelignite bombs. Uh, yeah, it was kind of, uh, kind of crazy. Uh, the miners went on strike, uh, causing rolling blackouts. Right, we used to get the newspaper... And it would tell us when we'd have electricity. <laughs> like, okay, no power at all on Thursday. Uh, 
we've got power on Friday, Saturday morning, and Sunday night. So we're like, oh, okay, well, we'll cook a chicken on Wednesday, and we could have a salad on Thursday. It didn't matter when we'd have hot water for bathing because British people don't bathe. <laughs> so that was fine. <laughs> that was fine. Um, but yeah, Margaret Thatcher is using the police to break up the miners' strike. It was weird. I'm in the north of England, and we would do a deal at the door if you if you brought your your parents' uh, miners' union uh, card. You got half price drinks at the door, and we'd let you in for free. This is like community based. Everybody's trying to help each other. It's kind of a strange time. This is from the BBC um, website. Trafalgar Square was a mountain of black garbage bags twitching with rats. <laughs> no bread. They flew in bread from France until that was stopped. Fuck. And if there was flour in the house, one had to bake. The worst strike for many was on throwaway nappies or disposable diapers, is how you would understand that. But listen, go, go back to the other bit. If there was flour in the house, like, that's how bad things, if there was flour, then you would bake. I remember one time I had to wait two hours outside a fruit shop just to get some milk. It's crazy. Like, if you guys had to wait wait 14 minutes for a Wi-Fi connection, your fucking heads would blow up. <laughs> I don't remember all the political chaos, but I do remember playing Scrabble by candlelight. That's kind of cool, isn't it? And the fact that we couldn't bury my deceased grandfather, my mother never forgave the Labour government or the trade unions for that. So I think I would have put, I would have put that first. If that was my, if I was typing in on the BBC's website, right? Like, hey, Carl, yeah, I saw your entry. You put Scrabble first. Well, granddad's, uh, granddad's dead upstairs. But you're, you're going on about the Scrabble. I think I'd flip that. I love the bread strike, as my grandmother would make proper bread in her oven, and it was better than anything you could buy in the shops. I remember the smell which lingered in the house. It was beautiful, unlike the smell of granddad wafting, <laughs> wafting down. The, the Ramones formed in 1974. This is stuff, I used to think um, that punk rock was an English thing. You know, I think we all thought, all of us English punks, we thought, oh, it's a fucking English thing. But before there was punk in England, the Ramones formed, 1974, uh, Forest Hills, Queens. And because I've been traveling around, I also found out that the Saints, any Australians here? There was Australians at UX. Any Australians? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean good, there aren't any, I mean good, I meant good, we'll move on. I didn't mean good, to, <laughs> fuck. fuck. Um, so the Saints, so I was thinking, well, did it start in England or did punk start in New York? At the same time as the Ra Ramones were starting, uh, the Saints formed in Brisbane. Kind of an interesting band. And the Ramones single came out before the Saints single, but... It couldn't have influenced the Saints because they had a single come out like three weeks later and you know, you're in production for like six or seven weeks at the pressing plant. So it's like this punk thing was just happening everywhere is, is what I get. As I said, I'm not an expert, but that's what I get from this. New York Dolls, 75. Um, Malcolm McLaren, who uh, managed the Sex Pistols, yeah. Uh, he helped them with management in New York. He got the band red leather outfits to wear on stage and a communist flag. So <laughs> I'm now chair of the music business department, SAE, in Chicago, and our management class, that, that isn't how we're going to define management. You know, <laughs> here's your checklist. Okay, red leather, <laughs> red leather outfits, check. Communist flag, check. I'm the band's, fuck, where's my 20%? I'm the band's manager. Uh, interestingly, the Smiths, Morrissey, and R.E.M.'s Michael Stipe are both fans of the New York Dolls. Morrissey was the president of the Dolls UK fan club. What a sad loser. 
Not that it was like, up until this point, he was awesome, and now with this new information, it's like, oh, oh, shit. <laughs> Music. In the UK, we had ABBA. Yes. <laughs> Elvis. Yeah, it was Elvis last night at the White Sox. It was fucking terrible. Elvis tribute night. Rod Stewart, Donna Summer, I Feel Love. David Soul, Wings and Kenny Rogers. Anybody remember David Soul? He was half of uh, Starsky and Hutch. This was the big hit single at the time. Don't give up on us, baby. Don't make the wrong seem right. The future isn't just one night. Well, say start from the beginning. Yeah, no, okay. Yeah. Don't give up on us, baby. So, oh, hello. Thanks a lot. Anybody? Is that me? It's me. Sorry. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Starsky, yeah. No, I was just talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> so, fair warning. Where's Ash? Cover your ears. There's all kinds of language in this... <laughs> In this clip. <laughs> so, 1976, the Bill Grundy interview. This, so, I've got to tell you a few things about life in England. There were three television channels. Like, what? Yeah, three. <laughs> um, there's a BBC One, BBC Two with no commercials, and then a commercial station, ITV, whatever. And... Television was a big part of English life. Everybody in England would watch Monty Python or Benny Hill or whatever at the same time and then talk about it, the whole country. Um, it's a big difference here in the States with the time zones and, and all the channels and everything. Um, so people would, come, people would come home from work and sit at the kitchen table and have the evening meal with the family and the television. Right. So this isn't like a cable channel where you can choose to watch the channel and expect some language. This was 5.30 uh, news time. They are punk rockers. The new craze, they tell me. They're heroes, not the nice, clean Rolling Stones. You see, they're as drunk as I am. They are clean by comparison. They're a group called the Sex Pistols. I am told that that group have received £40,000 from a record company. Doesn't that seem uh, to be slightly opposed to their anti-materialistic view of life? Uh, more to marry. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, tell me more about it. Fuck, it's a bank, we? I don't know, have you? Yeah, yeah. it's all good. No one even heard that one, because he was drunk himself and he wasn't paying attention. When he asked, well, what do you do to money? And I said, we fucking spent it. Well, tell me more about it. Fucking spent it, haven't we? I don't know, have you? Yeah, yeah. it's all gone. Really? Down yep. the it, Really? Good Lord. Now, I want to know one thing. Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, and Brown all died. Bars, they? Really? Oh, what what, what, what are we saying, sir? wonderful people. Are they? Oh, yes, they really turn us on. What do they do? Well, suppose they turn other people on. That's just their tough treat. And Rotten, he slipped up and said, shit under his breath. It's what? Nothing, a rude word. Next question. No, no, what was the rude word? Shit. What is it really? Good heavens, you right. frightened little oh, girl. All right. so what about you girls good. behind? Right. So, that's Bill Grundy, he was fired. Uh, he was dr I mean, amongst other things, he was just drunk, you know. Um, that's pretty famous. That's Susie from Susie and the Banshees up in the corner there. Um, the next day, 
I'm still in the north of England. Um, we go to our rehearsal room. We walk in to like reception area. Whoa. Somebody had just chalked punk rock on the wall. And I'm like, this sounds completely ridiculous, I know, but we were like, oh, stop, shh, there's punks, there's punks about. I mean, <laughs> it was fucking scary. We were like, well, why, where are they? <laughs> Hold my hand, there's punks. It was, it was just weird. Um, I think everybody in the country got kind of pissed off, and somehow, punks that I wasn't I wasn't part of a of, of any punk scene then. I was still playing in the mind where technical proficiency was the order of the day. How fast could you drum? Um, how fast of a lead guitarist you were? It was all musical masturbation to to the nth degree, and um, we weren't just frightened by punks with safety pins stuck in their noses. We didn't understand it. We were frightened because we didn't understand the music either. So the uniform of, of that time was Doc Martin boots. I still wear my Doc Martins, which is weird because it's kind of a skinhead thing. I, I don't, the punks just kind of went, oh, well, we'll have those. Those are useful. We'll have those shoes. Uh, piercings, hair, um, personalized and mutilated fashion. I just got fly. I still fuck my suits up. Questioning anything, stenciling anything that's easy to produce. That's my first punk suit. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> it's fucking awesome. We went on a, uh, yeah, we, we kind of went, we went for some interesting shit back then. This is Mary Sweeney. Uh, I, I, I asked my Facebook friends, what did punk mean to you? And I really like, she's a uh, photographer here in town, and I love what she had to say, Je apart from jeepers, which is not punk. <laughs> jeepers! Uh, I could write a book about what punk meant or means to me. In a very rudimentary way, it meant that I didn't have to be a sheep. I was with other people that could think for themselves, question what they heard, and live outside of that ridiculous box everybody talks about being outside of but never are. Punk music challenged me and pushed me to never stop asking why and to never let no be the final word unless I said it. It was being an individual in the middle of like minds. Just love the way she expressed that. Um, this is where it gets frightening when we, if you're technically proficient. This is, it, it's not from sniffing glue fanzine, which is also something we should talk about. Everybody was making their own little magazines and fanzines. This was uh, attributed to sniffing glue, but actually it wasn't a sniffing glue fanzine. Uh, this is a chord. Here's another. Here's a third. Now form a band. Boom. Punk as fuck. Just, just go do it. Yeah, but we've got to, I'm just working on my paradiddles. Fuck off. Three chord start a band. <laughs> in the US, Seymour Stein, and I'm mentioning Seymour because we'll come back to him at the end via China. Um, he signed the Ramones. Uh, he recorded their first album for $6,400 and released that album. Uh, Sex Pistols signed to EMI. Their first single, Anarchy in the UK, <laughs> on EMI, the band are immediately dropped. Uh, <laughs> My friend Simon, you remember Simon from England, Harrison? We used to go and see football with him. He, bu he bought a copy of that at auction at Sotheby's for like three and a half thousand pounds. And he's like, Shh, don't, don't tell my wife, she's going to kill me. <laughs> and he was on the news that night. And a Coventry guy, <laughs> he was like, he was, yeah, he was in trouble. Um, but they signed to EMI and were dropped almost immediately. In the middle of all of this stuff, um, they signed their contract with their next label, uh, with A&M, in front of Buck Buckingham Palace and displayed the cover of their next single, God Save the Queen. Which, you know, I look at that now and I'm like, okay, I've seen some kind of edgy artwork in my time. Once again, I need to tell you something about England. The Queen comes into our homes on Christmas Day to address the country. My granddad used to stand 
to attention. Not like standing during the national anthem here at a baseball game with hot dog and nachos and some other you know, funnel cake and a beer and a margarita. <laughs> but he would like stand to like uh, 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 rigorous attention with the, th- the salute. It's the queen coming into our homes. Even, I'd be walking around London sometimes with some crusty, fucked up lunatic. And they'd be like, uh, scrambling around on the ground for like a, 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 a half-smoked uh, cigarette or, or some s- a bottle of cider or something. And the, one of the queen's cars would go by, or the queen mother, and they'd stand up. Uh, they'd stand up. The queen was a big thing. So when I first saw the cover of God Save the Queen, I just... It's you drawing you. It's fucking outrageous. It was like when I drew Mickey Mouse ears on Chairman Mao in China. It was bad shit. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you know, A and M uh, was Herb Alpert's label. Um, he sold 13 million uh, recordings. He outsold the Beatles. Don't have to tell you guys that, but there you go. Um, so f- from pressure for all of the pe- from all the other artists signed to A uh, and M. Uh, Herb dropped the Sex Pistols, and we'll see him later in the story too. And in the middle of all of this, uh, it's this weird kind of thing that happens in a revolution or a movement. The Sex Pistols just got blamed for everything. Granddad upstairs, putrefying, the nappies that weren't getting picked up, the lack of bread, the garbage in the streets. It kind of was like the, the fucking Sex Pistols did it, which they obviously didn't, <laughs> right? But that, it, that's what happened. Um, Malcolm McLaren, great fucking manipulator and prodder of the press, uh, but not a great traditional manager, so the band didn't have any of the, of the services you'd expect from any kind of management, like some security or somebody with a car, right? So... After that Bill Grundy interview, I think in, in the weeks after, w- one of the guys was knifed. When I used to go to Gunter Grove in Chelsea, which is where John still has a house, to go and get paid uh, when, I, when I joined Public Image Limited, sometimes the door would just be off its hinges. They're like, hello. And John would come to the top of the stairs with a sword. Not like, hey, Dungeons and Dragons, a fucking sword. <laughs> It was just kind of crazy. The Sex Pistols couldn't perform anywhere anymore. They would do, uh, they would try and do shows, S-P-O-T-A, Sex Pistols Spots, under assumed name, but as soon as anybody found out it was the Sex Pistols, they couldn't play. And the same was true uh, for the Saints in Australia. The Saints couldn't play anywhere either. So, 77. I'm not in Public Image Limited yet. I've moved to London I hennaed my hair. Anybody hennaed their hair here? It's kind of, but you know what it is, right? You, right? It's like a, it's basically a big pile of cow shit. Then you mix it up and stick it in your hair and it turns it red. Not red enough for me. It was a little bit, it was, well, I'm colorblind and it was subtle, right? <laughs> so after two weeks, I'm like, fuck this henna shit. I'll go Billy Idol, I'll fucking bleach it. <laughs> so so I ble- I've got some Born Blonde, it was still called that then, and I bleached my hair, and I had one of these moments where I came up from the sink, here we go, it's a nice day for a white wedding. Fuck. <laughs> the bleach activated the henna, and it was pure, it wasn't like carrot, it was like carrot! Whoa! But here's where it gets kind of weird. You know, I'm I'm already late to go to work. I'm working for the government just off Trafalgar Square uh, by St. Martin's in the Field Church. There's St. Martin's in the Field Church. I'm working just to the left of that. When I wasn't working, I was sitting on the steps of of, uh, Nelson's Column, slagging on the tourists for making the sandwiches so expensive. <laughs> right, but I go into work with my carrot hair and it's like, oh, uh, we need to have a talk. Okay, yeah, here we go. Uh, 
for the, for the next two weeks, there was like a tribunal about my hair. I mean, they're like, yeah, you can't, you can't do that and work for the government. So anyway, relax, but we might fire you at some point in the next two weeks. I mean, it's fucking heavy shit over dyeing your hair. I mean, Ash, die every second day with a, tw what color will it be today, Ash? Right? It's hilarious and it's awesome. But this was heavy shit in 76. It was like, what the fuck? So. Looking down at King's Road, I see so many faces. They come from many places. They come out for the day. They walk around together and try and look trendy. I think it's a shame. So we used to get pissed off with anybody who like messed their hair up or like make made a faux hawk on a Friday night. Here we fucking go, you know, safety pin up the nose, <laughs> and then flattened it out on a Monday. We called them the part-time punks. And any of us who like bleached our hair or disfigured ourselves in a p more permanent way will get pissed off with the part-time punks. It's also interesting to note that any kind of vocal tuning, guitar tuning, or everybody playing in the same key seems to have <laughs> slightly vanished as well. I love that song. <laughs> uh, 78, this is The Undertones. They released a single with a guy called John Peel. Uh, he, he gave them money to do this. They didn't have money for the sleeve, so they just Xeroxed uh, some posters at Kinko's or the English equivalent, which was called Pronto Print. Um, and I love what they did, aside from the art of this. This is a punk thing too. The undertones are shit. You just completely grab the power from a fucking journalist, right? So now a journalist from the NME or Sounds or Melody Maker can't go, well, <coughs> In my opinion, I've seen lots of bands, and I think the undertones are shit. Like, yeah, no, we fucking said that. <laughs> Say something original, you asshole. I, that's punk. I love it. So it's a do-it-yourself movement. We're questioning everything. We're questioning authority. <laughs> Anybody know this genre? <laughs> Out. <laughs> it is, of course, oh, a, a slideshow nightmare. Um, that was punk. You know, my son Harrison had the cars on his iPod driving up from Chicago, and it just sounds like bubblegum pop to me now. The cars were punk, like weirdly. But this is The Stranglers from 78, Golden Brown, and it's punk because it was The Stranglers, and it's a song about heroin, Golden Brown. It's like weird. Elvis Costello and Allison, if you listen to that, and UMG won't let us because they're fucking assholes. <laughs> Allison, except in tune with the guitar and Elvis Costello with slightly different glasses. Ah, it's just a fucking country and western sing-along song. But we were like, oh, fucking punk. It's, isn't that, it's just weird to me to just think about that. Elvis Costello was punk, but if you, if you listen without watching, it wasn't. It's just weird. I don't have any conclusions. Um, it's not just record labels and music. Clothes, brands, and publications. This is my friend Jared Cosloy, right? <laughs> they put me in the interview at the last minute. This is uh, 19, and I became Americanized and Marty. Um, yeah. So I joined Public Image Limited in 79. I play on, uh, co write one song on the Metal Box, which was three 12 inch singles inside of a, basically a film canister with the logo of the band embossed in the lid, which was just awesome. These punk kids uh, got into a fight. 
uh, they were making a hash brownie in the lid of the album. I mean, wh who of us hasn't done that? And, uh, <laughs> and they got into a fight over who got the brownie with the pill logo. Like, this, you know, that's when I became, I have a whole p two hour packaging lecture and I think that's where it started. Um, I, so, I think Vivian Goldman, uh, who, who's touring right now actually, did this, this interview um, for Melody Maker. And look how punk I've become. So, I've been playing drums since I was nine, and I was pretty <laughs> fucking good. But when I get my interview with Melody Maker, I'm like, I'm not a drummer. I just hit things. <laughs> what the fuck? What the <laughs> it's like... I'm not a drummer. I just fucking hit things, don't I? Ooh, fuck. This is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Oh, here's some pictures. Oh, smoking a cigarette or incense in the room or something. <laughs> I've got some amazing shots of John, not because I'm a, any kind of a pho good photographer. I just had a really nice 35mm camera and just took shots whenever I felt like it. Yes! This is... <laughs> yeah. If any of you were ever wondered how much snot can actually <laughs> hang off your nose before it falls off, well, there's the answer. <laughs> About 10 inches. Yeah. In 2006, I go across to China um, and I stumble across a club called D22. Uh, it's a kind of a punk club that was set up very much like CBGB's. Made an album of my own uh, and recorded a band called Snapline, which is now a favorite of Seymour Stein's, which is kind of like, oh shit, how weird is that? They've just uh, performed at South by Southwest in 2012. And I released a red vinyl seven inch. It wasn't until I did it and actually put this lecture together that I realized I'd copied the undertones and I bought these posters, these c posters from the Cultural Revolution and folded them up and basically copied Teenage Kicks from the undertones. I gave a video camera to Ji Chen, the singer from Snapline, uh, which is kind of a punk thing to do. The first thing he filmed at D22 was the New York Dolls performing acoustically. It was kind of interesting. I think a couple of people said to me as I handed this guy a video camera, not a particularly good one, a mini DV cassette tape video bullshit camera. What are you doing? Give it, you might never see that camera again. I don't care about the camera. He sent me the tapes of the New York Dolls performing acoustically. It's kind of awesome. I wrote a second book and I give that away. I think that's punk as fuck. And where's the influence of punk now? Threadless? Punk as fuck. Those guys are punk as fuck. Zappos, Nike, Converse, Red Bull, Chaos Pilot is a school in Denmark where their mission is to teach kids to surf on chaos. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> it's fucking awesome. I called, um, I called one of the guys. And he's like, hello, yes, we just landed in Vietnam. I'm like, whoa, are you on vacation? He's like, no, I'm here with 10 students. I'm like, wow, what are you doing? They're like, we don't know. <laughs> Something. I'm like, fuck, yeah. Um, my, my version of punk is not being the guy with the yellow mohawk pissing my pants uh, drinking Red Stripe, throwing rocks at the building from the outside. My version of punk is being on the inside and changing things that way. In the early days, it was using major record labels, fax machines and phone lines, or getting prescription speed from a bent doctor on Harley Street so I could be at JFK in New York and, like, and pop pills in front of a cop. Like, brilliant! <laughs> Don't ever stop listening, Harrison. <laughs> like, and I had the prescription in my pocket, so if there ever was trouble, I was like, ready, like, here we go, more speed, uh, in front of a cop. What an idiot thinking, hey, back off, cop with a gun, I've got a prescription. Oh. 
In that case, Mr. Atkins, proceed. Um, this is uh, Wayne Mason. He's from uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, he's punk as fuck. He got tired of trying to get help from the city of Halifax for the Halifax Pop Explosion, which is this awesome pop festival that's been going on for 20 years. So he put on a suit and tie and ran for council. Now he's inside the machine fucking things up. Jared Kosler, who started Conflict, now runs Matador Records uh, in New York. Why is that there? Why is that there? Oh, I know why that's there. Um, the girl who made my first punk suit, Sandy Powell, didn't get her fourth costume Oscar for the costumes that she did for Hugo, but she nearly did. Johnny Rotten lives down the street from Herb Alpert. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a tape recording. Like, we went out for sushi in Malibu, as you do. <laughs> and it was like, so you come off Pacific Coast Highway, and John's like, and I'm not going to do his accent. So, yeah, keep coming down Pacific Coast Highway. They take that left after Trancas Market. Not the first house. That's Herb Alberts. <laughs> keep coming. I'm like, you fucking asshole. You Malibu asshole. Uh, punk is now a beer. What the fuck? What, what it should be is like nothing inside. It's not a beer. Fuck off. That's a fuck you. <laughs> it's a fucking beer. <laughs> what would Johnny Rotten say now? Do I buy country life butter because it's British? Do I buy country life because I yearn for the British countryside? <laughs> All because he's made only from British milk. <laughs> nah, I buy country life because I think it tastes the best. It's not about Great Britain, it's about Great Butter. People's fucking heads exploded when they saw that. Huh? Fuck. Yeah. Well, actually, no, his, actually his wife, Nora, owns the largest daily newspaper in Germany, the Tagesspiegel. So their neighbor is, the next castle down the Rhine is Mr. Beck. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he didn't need to do that. And of course, how weird to, to go from being attacked by the police and stabbed in the street to becoming a spokesperson for English dairy products. And sales went up. 60%. <laughs> so punk is a beer. At least we still have anarchy. Don't we? <laughs> it's not complicated. It's a new fragrance from Axe. Yeah, anarchy for him. <laughs> what? Well, you shout like like that has anything to do with anything in your future today? But girls, don't worry. Yeah, anarchy for her. Anarchy for her. But no, no, no. No, no, no. Here's the thing, though. I think this is a rip-off because I think they both smell exactly the same. What do you, what do you, what do you think? They both smell exact, right? What do you think? Okay, look. Don't, don't look at the can. Just. Don't smell it. You walk through the cloud. <laughs> what the <laughs> it just hangs doesn't it it just hangs 
<laughs> Unexpected lessons. Fuck. Oh. No, but a few people down the front actually needed that. I mean, you know. No, that's one of the reasons that Jim invited me. He said, look, things get a bit stinky about two-thirds of the way through the day. If you can come and do that spray thing, it's a great way to keep everybody smelling fresh and keep networking. <laughs> Unexpected lessons. I don't know what they are, so okay. All right. So the first time I did this lecture, it was like four or five slides, whatever. Um, I end my lecture and I say, so that is why punk is unique. It's never happened before. It will never happen again. Nobody's ever done it. One of a kind thing. And there it is. Punk, the socioeconomic backdrop to the punk rock revolution. Ta-da! And Ken Lopez says, <coughs> says, does that remind the class of anything? And I'm like, uh, point of order, Ken. How could it remind anybody of anything because it's unique? It's never happened before. It happened one time. It was awesome, and it happened, and there it is. And someone in the class says, uh, reminds me of the Delta Blues. I'm like, uh, what? And then they kind of told me why it reminded them of the Delta Blues. And I'm like, oh, shit. And I fucking love learning shit. Not particularly like that on stage in front of a bunch of students looking like an idiot. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, tired of the unreal. And, and they were talking about the, the economic uh, backdrop to Delta Blues. But look at this. Tired of the unrealistic and complacent lyrics of God Bless America, Woody Guthrie pens, This Land is Your Land. Kind of like God Save the Queen. Right? I fucking love that. Also, anybody into, uh, what was it, Creative Commons, Copy Wrong? Well, he's fucking there way before any of us. There's no copyright on, on This Land Is Your Land. He wrote on the copyright form, this song belongs to everybody. Kind of a dude. <laughs> wow, I didn't realize I'd be presenting in front of the Woody Guthrie fan club. <laughs> but welcome to Madison. It's pretty wild, isn't it? Three chords of two minutes, and I'm like, this, this wasn't at USC, this is just me stumbling across shit and kind of going, holy fuck. Lastly, what is lastly? Oh! <laughs> Did anybody see this? Well, stay tuned. Swear words, so that's, 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 uh, that's a little bit. Uh, well, if you say it with an accent like that, they will um, swear I, I, I want people to buy me book, fucking book. Oh, oh we are so sorry. Uh, good morning, America. Man, oh man. I'm sorry, I slipped into a brand of acting. <laughs> like, what the fuck? I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, is this where we are now? Anybody can say fuck on the television? It's just like, oh, oh sorry, I just said fuck. Oh, I said it again. That's why it's fuck. How bizarre! Johnny Rotten's selling butter and Tom Hanks is saying fuck. Pretty wild. Um, the last thing I want to do for you, it wouldn't be one of my lectures if I didn't throw blueberry muffins at people. This has got nothing to do with anything. Oh! <laughs> Catches muffins, destroys $2,000 laptop. <laughs> Why do I throw blueberry muffins? Because at one point I used to have a white vinyl seven inch scratch and sniff blueberry single from a band from Chicago called the... What? Really? You stole it from my lecture, didn't you? Um, so I just, I haven't done a lecture without throwing blueberry muffins at people. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Boom. Oh! 
Um, anybody else desperately? Oh. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else want a spray of deodorant? What? Oh, muffins. Okay. So, uh, that's, oh, that's my second book. Welcome to the music business. You're fucked. If anybody wants to. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Boom. See? His lecture was shit, but that boy can throw some muffins. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> One question I have is, didn't these guys give you any lunch? I mean, why are you you're desperate for candy and muffins? I mean, what's going on with the refreshments here? I'm, I'm just posing a question. I don't know. <laughs> that was just uncalled for. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>